So, Noah Max, welcome to round two. A year on. <laughs> a year on. Just over a year on. I've checked the YouTube video that we did last time mm. in your lovely garden. And uh, that was exactly oh, just a year and a week. You're kidding. Since then. Really? Yes. And lots has happened since then with you. Feels like ages ago, yeah. Yes. And that was the first time we met. That was the first time we met. Well, thanks for having me back. It's wow. great to do. Well, this is part three, depending on how you're counting. Because, of mm. course, we did the live event in Putney. That's right. That's so, right. Yeah, looking so forward this is to part it. three. Yes, but there's so much to talk about with you because you have such a uh, interesting and colourful life so far, and you're a very young man. So that's very impressive. So let's talk about Echo Ensemble. Can you tell us a story about the founding of this ensemble? Where were you in your life? What were you going through? And uh, what was the process of getting this bunch of talented people together in one space to create music? Sure. Um, I was at the Purcell School. I think I was either 15 or just 16. And I was surrounded by these wonderful musicians, these new close friendships and relationships we were building. And I was just coming to the point where I was realising that cello wasn't what I wanted to do with my life. It was like a gateway drug that had opened me up to new possibilities. Mm. And I was composing and I wrote a piece for Symphonietta called Three Echoes. And I thought, you know, no one else is just going to decide to do this. So I'm going to have to put it on myself, which I think is the right attitude for every composer watching this to take. So... I put together an ensemble of my colleagues. It's like an 11 or 12 piece ensemble, uh, this eight minute piece. And I needed something to name the group chat. <laughs> so I called it Echo Ensemble because the piece we were doing was called Three Echoes. And that just stuck. Uh, as my teacher at the time said, you know, if you've hit on a great name, don't go changing it. <laughs> I just keep that consistency of brand. Branded. Brand. Yeah. So we did this concert and it was it was really exciting. That was in... 2016. So I'm, I must have been 16 or, or maybe actually it was slightly later on. I was 16 and a half or so. Um, and then I revitalized it after. I can't remember if we touched on this last time, but I went to the Royal Academy of Music as a cellist. And after about five minutes, I decided that wasn't for me. And I parachuted out and started building a freelance career, much of which was based around Echo because I was conducting Echo and I was programming my own music around other pieces I wanted to do. Um, so once I'd left the academy and my time was sort of more my own again, I managed to revitalize the ensemble and we did three concerts in 2018. We did twice that, we did six in 2019. 2020 obviously was an odd year. We did tons of online stuff and we were actually the first ensemble in the country to do uh, a group concert again. I think the LSO were doing outdoor things at St. Luke's. They'd done solo and duo concerts, but we did a 10-piece ensemble concert. Uh, and then later in the year, we did an indoor distance one. And then 2021 again was was full of exciting goodies. Uh, and we're now building on that, continuing with lots of very exciting, varied events. We had a mini tour this year. And um, God, it, it's been incredibly exciting. I can't believe that, you know, next year will be seven years old, which means I need to start planning a 10th anniversary. It's ridiculous. You know, it, it's like if, if I'd had a child seven years ago, it'd be like <laughs> thinking about having a 10th birthday for your child. It's, exactly. It's crazy. Yeah. Going on to secondary school, nearly. Oh, no, don't even, <laughs> don't even. Yeah, goodness. So you founded this ensemble when you were very young. Mm. Did you do any of this um, sort of networking and bringing people together before you did Echo Ensemble? Was there precedent? Was there experience that you had with... I guess, project creation, project management? Was this the first big thing that you did? It's a good question. Well, I was interested in films and filmmaking. So I sort of just, again, I was writing stuff and on the weekend I would shoot it and usually I'd do it just with myself or occasionally with one friend. But towards the end of that time, I did actually start pulling together larger groups of people. Um, there was this documentary I started making about the education system, which was mostly born out of my resentment and not feeling understood <laughs> at school before I got to uh, <laughs> before I got to the first L school, um, which was a totally ridiculous project. But, you know, I was going up and down the country on trains and visiting people, pulling them together, conducting interviews. I got like 30 hours of footage. Wow. 
and you know it's all still sitting i think i got it down to 11 hours in the last cut i did before i <laughs> abandoned it um but yes yeah, so i was always sort of doing ambitious things and you know i i you know was doing these huge paintings there, there was one painting i did at school where um it was so huge that actually the whole class sort of came and um, it was like, you know, an artist these days often has a studio full of assistants. Yeah. Um, yeah. And everyone was slightly kind of disenchanted and bored with their own work. But they saw I was kind of sweating and struggling over this enormous <laughs> canvas. So they all came and started helping me with some of the corners and things. Mm -hmm. and that, that, that was quite sweet. I, I don't know. I, I quite like um, drawing people together, building a, a, a team dynamic and encouraging people to believe that they can be more together than they thought they were capable of when they were apart. And mm. that's certainly true with the orchestra is the stuff that we're able to achieve is often, and my players have come back and said this to me, is that they feel it's actually beyond what, you know, they're, they're the way they'd envision their own capabilities. So yes. I guess that I've always been interested in. Yes, I, I actually relate to that point. Um, when I was studying in undergraduate, I put on this really big orchestral concert, mm. which was um, Ravel Piano Concerto. Oh, wow. And it was preceded by Shostakovich Jazz Suite Number 2. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, so yeah. there were it's these two big orchestral things, and the, the college only had so much players, so many players. So it was a uh, an exercise of trying to reach out to other universities and try to bring in, outsource other instrumentalists mm. to make up for this orchestra that was sort of um, putting together. Yeah. And I was very young at that time; I was twenty years old. Never even put together a chamber orchestra, let alone. A massive orchestral project so it's a bit daunting mm. overwhelming there are many times i wanted to give up because it was just too many moving parts um so many instrumentalists with their own schedules and um problems with music hire and everything and oh. distribution and don't get me started on that booking stuff so <laughs> i mean you mentioned that you were passionate about doing all these big projects mm. does stress play a part when you're doing these things oh yes and your story uh, big can relate um it, it's i think stress is an interesting one because actually under the right circumstances it can be a really good driver i i find that you know again it's it's another form of energy that can sort of possess you and ideally you know the good form of stress it's like there's good and bad cholesterol, right? Um, in its best possible form, stress doesn't feel like stress. It feels like excitement and drive, dedication, mm. commitment. Yes. Because you have a vision for what it is you're doing, which is so strong, and you're aiming single-mindedly towards that thing. Uh, and everything else is, is like, you know, just going to chop through the weeds. Whatever uh, obstacle is going to present itself, you're just going to find a way through it, no matter what. I feel very much like that about the opera, which we're, I know we'll talk about later. But um, I mean, I can certainly think of times in my life, I'm sure you can too, when, when stress get, gets the better of you. Mm. Uh, and I suppose it's knowing how to manage oneself in that situation, particularly if you're leading a project, often you need to be the strong leadership figure and, and you don't want to show the stress. You want to take charge and, and show people a way through. Maybe they're stressed too. You want to calm their fears a little bit. Or sometimes... Sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes you want to create a bit of a sense of urgency. <laughs> and then you need to know how to do that as well. Particularly with musicians, you know, if often we were rehearsing evenings, you know, 6 till 9 p.m., the graveyard slot. And these guys have been rehearsing already 9 a.m. through 5.30 p.m. They dash onto your rehearsal and they're there. And, you know, they love the projects um, and we're good friends and they love the music. But... The energy is just not there. And, and how to cultivate a sense of urgency mm. around that is really interesting. Luckily, Echo has a really strong community family feeling. So there's a sense of responsibility in the room. And I sense that people tend to tend to perk up for one another uh, when the situation requires it, which, mm -hmm. is, which is good. What's the dynamic like between, between you guys and um, during rehearsals? Can you tell us a bit about it's that? It's lovely. It's really, really nice. It's some of the people that I work with in Echo, is this right? It must be right. Some of them I've actually been playing with for upwards of 15 years, wow. given how young we all are. I mean, you know, we all started as string players pretty young, making chamber music. 
um, our lead cellist, Wallace, I actually played with for the first time when I was about eight or nine uh, in the Wigmore Hall as part of a pro corda. Uh, I think it was a fundraising event or an anniversary concert or something. Um, and, you know, she now plays with us in almost every concert we do. And she's a great friend. Um, you know, obviously not everybody in the ensemble is, is somebody that I'm super duper close with uh, like that. But we're all, it's a very collegiate environment. And I only work with people now who I think would have been game to do the early projects when we were kind of dashing around like guerrilla filmmakers with no money sort of trying to get stuff for, for free or as cheap as possible and basically people just bought into the project on passion they weren't interested in whether there was a fee or not now obviously people have got o uh, older and and the demands on their time and their resources are different and something I committed to during the COVID pandemic when I saw how some of my friends were struggling was that I was going to make sure that every project that Echo did was uh, not just paid, but actually paid pretty yeah. well, as well as we can manage, so that I can support these musicians who I care about um, and help them, you know, for want of a better expression, put a roof over their head for doing work they actually really enjoy. Because mm. sometimes in the freelance life, you've just got to take on everything that comes your way, whether it's stuff you love, stuff you hate, or kind of in between something you're apathetic about. So I want to work with these people on stuff that, really lights a fire in them so i yeah. guess that creates a, a special atmosphere yes if you have i should have done this at the, at the beginning but if you had to describe echo and ensemble to someone who doesn't know anything about the ensemble hmm. how would you describe it to them well we create these unique experiences for the audience and for the artists and of course there you know there's an overlap there it kind of effuses uh between one and t'other and that's the case whether we're doing a conventional concert program or we're doing something completely off the wall and unique. So this tour we did recently, uh, it was just a mini tour, we, we did this Babel project, uh, which was an open score piece that I'd written called Babel. We did it in London as a chamber work and then we did it as an installation piece uh, by the sea in Walton on the Naze as part of the Frinton Festival and we actually performed Babel in a tower with one person on each floor and the audience could wander up and down and we had schools in in the morning and um, we had adults um, in, in, in the afternoon and evening with lots of performances all packed out, all sold out. Lots of these people had never seen a concert before. None of them, um, no, you, many of them hadn't been to a concert hall. Uh, I don't think any of the kids had. Uh, and, and some of the kids had never seen a musical instrument before. And so to be able to go up close and to actually touch one, speak to the players who of course were lovely people and wanted to interact with them um so i guess it's about spreading that little bit of magic mm. i hope that's what echo can do yeah well that, there's definitely magic in putting a concert on in the tower yeah that was <laughs> bizarre i saw i saw pictures <laughs> i was like wow that is taking it to the next level well i mean it's you say that but it, it, i mean obviously the, the story of babel inspired the piece as did the idea of wanting to do something in this special venue um the, the Nays Tower is a wonderful place. Uh, I think it used to have certain utility in various wars throughout the years. It's now been converted into an art gallery. They've got a lovely mm. tea rooms. Uh, anybody in Tendring or Essex or Suffolk should get down there. It's a lovely place, Nays Tower. Um, but what was interesting is that in the concert hall, you usually have the sounds arranged laterally. And, and you know, when you have stereo headphones, you've got things on the left and on the right. Um, but music didn't used to be arranged like that. It used to be arranged vertically. And if you listen to the Gabrielli music, for instance, which was designed to be performed in cathedrals in Venice with kind of horns and trumpets blaring down from the upper galleries uh, and the way that the resonance mixes on the vertical level, it's really profound and interesting. And I thought the acoustic would be rubbish and that we'd have real problems hearing each other and working it out, especially given that they're playing a piece, a piece of chamber music without being able to look at one another. Mm. Luckily, the piece is structured in such a way that they can uh, make it work. But actually, the, the, the acoustics were terrific. It was really exciting. And, and um, there was one performance we did, I think it was the five o'clock one, where the silence at the end of the piece, the theme from the beginning returns at the end. Uh, and we it's an open score piece, so you, you have an ensemble and you can decide who plays what, basically. And we had a trumpet, we put the trumpet on the top floor. And we, we had the opening and the closing theme played on the trumpet. Mm -hmm. uh, and as that last note kind of faded away, a little bit like the last post or something, this gust of wind entered the tower at the bottom and went whoosh, right the way up the top wow. and then down again. And everyone was just, we felt like we were in the presence of God or something. I mean, it was really bizarre. It was really bizarre. I can't tell you. Mm. And what was rehearsal like for that? 
Oh, could chaos you have any rehearsal, <laughs> any, re- any, rehearsal, <laughs> any rehearsal opportunities? And that's how well did you? Yeah, we did the night before. We came up for the night, stayed the night, went to the concert. There was an amazing orchestral concert uh, with the Frinton Festival Orchestra conducted by Dad. I, heroic changes of tempo in the Fledermaus Overture. I mean, unbelievable. <laughs> and the most astonishing Brahms too. I mean, it was deeply moving. And so many phrases, hinting at things we're going to talk about later. Mm-hmm. So many phrases, wonderful. Um, Dad is undoubtedly the best conductor I know, by the way. Um, but no, we, we rehearsed in there the night before. It was actually after the concert. So we were in there till like 10 p.m. And I was running up and down the tower. So seven floors, I think 111 steps. Mm-hmm. And I counted, I went up and down there uh, 32 times. So that's 64 <laughs> times 11. Really? Uh, 111, excuse me. What, whatever that is, that's the number of <laughs> stairs I did. Uh, so I was feeling really fit by the end. Um, but it was crazy uh, rehearsing we'd actually rehearsed it for the London concert the week before uh, and we did it in the rounds in in a you know fairly standard concert scenario I did an introductory talk giving people things ideas to latch on to you know why do I feel the need to set biblical texts in the 21st century all this stuff Um, so we'd actually got used to doing it a lot we'd run it a lot um, but doing it in the tower was I mean it was weird it was it was a slightly out of body experience mm. i would say mm. was so you put different instruments at different levels yeah so was there a deliberate choice on the hierarchy so putting for example trumps at the top or maybe a certain instrument at the bottom was there a thought put into the hierarchy of the instruments definitely so the double bass was at the bottom for practical reasons mm. it was hard enough getting the bass up that sure. one i mean it was really narrow staircase with like holes in it and you know a barely enough space to get the bass up it took about three people to get it up there and then you know had to come up and down several times um and we put the trumpet at the top we actually had a fanfare before the piece as people were walking over to the tower we had the trumpet go out on the roof and play a fanfare which you can listen to on youtube so cool semi-improvised based on bits of the piece Mm -hmm. uh that was cool that was rebecca toll uh, lovely again a close friend of mine um wonderful player and um but other than that, putting the bass at the bottom and the trumpet at the top, we sort of played it by ear. We saw how the scoring came together in our rehearsal process. And we did what felt right. But the cello in our version sort of pulled the whole thing together. So we put the cello bang in the center. Again, that was Wallace. Um, and we had two clarinets, so we didn't want to put them too close to one another. Yeah. Um, Daniel Swanee on flute and doubling recorder. He had the most marvellous recorder solo in the middle. I mean, it was really, it was so stupid and obscene. <laughs> you can't imagine anything like it. And, and I was just like, Dan, can we just try this on recorder? And, and when, once we tried it, everyone was in fits of laughter. We thought, okay, we've got to keep that. Um, so, it, yeah. So it kind of just came together. But yeah, the people who were up towards the top of the tower uh, really pick the short straw I would say <laughs> <laughs> having done that journey more yeah. than a few times I just wish I was there to hear it live I think that would be an I hope we'll do experience. it again I hope so too but you weren't conducting for this you just let them I was organising it was actually lovely to sit back and not do too much kind of hands on mm. sweaty conducting work and just let them do what they do best which is play they love to play together mm. and all the conducting stuff I'm basically trying to get to a point where I can get out of the way as much as possible to allow them to do that mm-hmm. That's, in a way, the most important thing. Yeah. Well, let's, that's a good segue to conducting. Let's sure. talk about conducting. Let's. Your experience with conducting. Um, what was your first conducting experience? So, because I was sort of the musical kid at school growing up, I was asked to kind of come up and do little bits. And actually, you know, kudos to my, my grandmother, Wendy, who was my first cello teacher, uh, and her mentor, Sheila Nelson, with whom I played chamber music. They got their kids playing in concerts for all the parents um, at least once a term. Uh, and then if you add kind of courses to that, you end up doing like 10 or 11 performances a year as a six-year-old in front of people. So you get over the stage fright pretty quickly. And um, so I was very happy just to kind of waltz up there and sort of wave my arms around without any idea what I was doing. (laughs) But when I was 12 or so, I was part of a a course called Marriott Players, which is a wonderful thing, takes place on Marriott Road in Wimbledon Mm -hmm. in the house of the very generous um, Margaret and Oscar Lewison. I I think Margaret's just got an MBE, actually, for her services to education and music, which is utterly well-deserved because these courses were great. 
and she made the most amazing brownies, <laughs> uh, which all the kids loved. But we were doing Stravinsky Concerto in D, which was his first neoclassical piece, if I'm not mistaken, and written in the 1940s. Mm. Uh, string orchestra piece, quite fiddly. They often put it in conducting competitions because there's some tricky metric changes. Uh, my dad was running this course. He was conducting it. And he said, if anybody wants to have a go conducting this passage, come to me and we'll do a lesson and we'll, you know, put you in front of the group and try it. And people were a bit nervous. A couple people did it and I decided I would do it. So I did a lesson with dad, who was a great <laughs> teacher. Um, and I still remember how this passage goes. Actually, I had another orchestra at Purcell called Philomel, which was the, the student-run orchestra, which passed from hand to hand. Uh, lots of my great friends and colleagues, uh, James Hoyle, composer, Phil Dutton, composer, um, Purcell students before my time, they'd all run Philomel. Um, and so when it came to my turn, I actually programmed the Stravinsky Concerto in D and we did it. Uh, and I now know from memory some of these, these tricky, tricky passages. But it was a completely inspiring experience a totally inspiring things to do and then later on i sort of fell into it when i was a bit disenchanted i guess with playing the cello and i felt like i wanted to take on a more sort of a role of oversight something more managerial mm. Mm. um and which would sort of in a selfish way allow me to to go to the next level with expressing myself and all these <laughs> things and, you know I, i'm not sure actually that that's the right reason to do it but i don't think that's the right reason to do it mm. but that was a factor in me taking it up i would mm -hmm. say and were there more lessons with dad on conducting? Oh, often? yeah. I would often take score. I still do. I take scores to him and, you know, watch that passage there. You know, be careful. You know, but he, he looks at scores incredibly deeply. I mean, he, he's looking at the moment at the Schoenberg um, five orchestral pieces, mm. which he's doing with an amateur orchestra, which, you know, amateur orchestras never do that piece. His orchestras, he trains them to such a high level. And, and he's looking at this score rather than, most people look at it like, oh, so, you know, this is a piece of atonal music by Schoenberg, pre-serial, so we've got to make it sound all angular and otherworldly and, you know, all these things. But he's looking at it as what it is, which is romantic music with incredibly advanced harmony. And he's looking at the place where actually Schoenberg missed a trick or two and made mistakes and, and you know, wasn't quite clear in his scoring about what he wanted because those are the kinds of problems that you have to solve as a conductor sometimes. Um so yeah, I, I I take all kinds of scores uh, to him. It's uh, and it's incredibly edifying to, to to work with him. He's brilliant. Was there something that he taught you that changed your perspective on either conducting or just music in general? Oh, music in general. There's loads because obviously he's a cellist as well. Yeah. So I I learnt from him his teacher's exercises, which were incredibly profound. But I, I think um, particularly my love of chamber music certainly is something I have inherited from dad and yeah he was he he was a tremendous influence just just the the passion is infectious and once you've looked at music on that deep level you never want anything less mm. so I sense it's from those early years I spent playing chamber music that I you know it's because of that that I've spent so much time striving for these kinds of results and I, and I only feel like very recently my kind of my aspirations for what I'd like to achieve have been able to sort of marry up with what I'm actually able to achieve compositionally as well um and you know dad's taken great pride in that as has mum you know it, it, it's and it's absolutely lovely it's it's lovely mm. have you ever conducted an orchestra with your dad in it yeah, he played in the outdoor concert actually, um, and it's it's interesting, you know. He, I think, when he's playing, he's he's there to serve the conductor no matter what. <laughs> I think he just had a great time. Um, I think the reason that that happened was because our other cellist who was going to be playing uh, got COVID the day before and couldn't play. Mm. So I, you know, you can spend days kind of just texting people trying to fix these things. Yes. I just went to dad and said, "Hey, do you want to play?" He's like. Actually, yeah, I haven't done a concert in a while. I, I'd really like to play. <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's my job. <laughs> yeah, it must be so. It must be so lovely to to play in an orchestra with your with your son up on a podium. It must be such a heartwarming moment. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it. I, I guess maybe it is. I've certainly played for him a few times, hmm. um, and I've always thoroughly uh, enjoyed it. And again, I guess the other thing I've taken from that is uh, particularly on Marriott players because at Marriott I was eleven, twelve years old playing this Stravinsky, which 
30, 40, 50 year olds struggled to comprehend. Uh, and the 18 year olds who were at a very high level uh, were teaching the younger kids how to aspire. And so the orchestra as a whole sounded absolutely tremendous. I actually wrote the, the fourth of my chakra pieces, Amber, I wrote for Marriott Players. And even though I've done it a lot since, the first performance was conducted by dads and mm-hmm. I, I played for that. And, and again, that, that sense of striving to do something which you didn't think was possible. Mm-hmm. Beginning of the week, you know, the nine-year-old kids looking at this thing going, you know, what on earth am I? I can't make head or tail of this. <laughs> but by the end of the week, they, they've actually developed an ear for an appreciation of mm. of music which doesn't necessarily sound the way they'd expect or isn't laid out the way they'd expect i try and do that as well with the kids pieces that i write um nebulae i suppose is a good example where, where that's a piece where i tried to marry up what kids are potentially capable of uh, and also pushing their ears towards a sound they maybe hadn't considered before mm. And uh, one of the groups I was coaching, the week we did that piece, uh, uh, String Quartet, so we they played in the concert the piece I coached them in, and then they suddenly announced that they'd written the piece, uh, and they played that, and you know it was it was forty five seconds long, but it was great, <laughs> and and these are ten year olds for crying out loud, yeah. I mean it's uh, Maurizio Cargill wrote lots of pieces which involved you know children's choirs and ensembles, P- Peter Maxwell Davies as well actually, although I I don't know a quote from him. But Cargill, I'm probably going to butcher this quote terribly, but, you know, to paraphrase, he, he said something along the lines of, um, you know, actually, in order to enthuse kids about music, it, it's not the institutional music making path they need. They need their imaginations cracked open, mm. you know, uh, to let it all sort of spill out, the opportunity mm. to contribute. Um it's, it's an incredibly exciting way of working, I think, because kids comprehend much more than than, than we give them credit for. They're really smart. Mm. They basically just haven't got as big a vocabulary as adults. But emotionally, mm. it's it's all there. Was there a moment for you that allowed your imagination to be cracked open? Mm. A moment or a piece that inspired you that just opened the floodgates for your creativity? A book, a person? It's a good question. An event? With regard, I mean... With regard to writing music, this is quite interesting because I had this discussion in a lesson with a teacher recently um, where he was trying to get me to listen to lots of different musical examples. And teaching by example is a pretty good way to teach. Yeah. Um, but I was saying that when I'm having a problem, I don't tend to look to composers for inspiration, mm. particularly composers I like and music I like, because mm. then you end up copying music you like yeah. which is yeah. you know it's a good way to learn but it's not a great way to write original music no. uh i tend to seek my inspiration in visual art and there are several galleries i went to when i was 14 or 15 there was a matisse cutouts gallery and there was a gallery of giacometti sculptures you know those works worn sculptures where i just completely fell in love with this whole world that these artists were creating and that love has absolutely endured and often when i'm looking for something you know the solution to a problem in a piece i I will look to visual art or actually my my conducting owes much more to my painting than it does to uh you know anything else i've done i would say because the the, you know the motion the movement the feeling the viscosity of the paint uh, and that inside also came from i I guess if there's one person who really inspired me in that visceral way it was my late mentor john whitfield um who tragically passed away uh, in 2019, end of 2019. Uh, he'd been very ill for a number of years with emphysema. He was only 62, 63. He'd founded Endymion Ensemble in his day. He was the most tremendous original thinker. I mean, he thought of music in terms of fabrics and textures and, and you know, your coarse wool and, you know, dyed satin and velvet. And, and, and he was a bassoonist. And if you listen to recordings of John Whitfield playing this bassoon, it doesn't sound like a bassoon at all. It sounds like music of the spheres. You know, it's the most incredible, magical. But yeah, he was an incredibly provocative person. He certainly, in his prime, rubbed some people up the wrong way. That's for sure. <laughs> um, but he, he was he was a wonderful man. And, and he also wanted me not to make some of the mistakes he felt that he made. He was very generous with his um, great knowledge and expertise. Hmm. And... 
uh, it's such an interesting point you make about painting and conducting because mm. the motions are quite similar. Very. I never thought about it that way, that connection. Well, that was John. Yeah, he, he said, I, I actually printed a book of his best emails to me. Uh, I, <laughs> I called it the book of John, which he would have book hated. John. <laughs> um, but it, it's, I mean, I only printed about 100 copies and I gave them to people who knew John and people, you know, just a, a couple of close friends uh, around that time. But um, there was something he wrote he, he's about, because often he would look at pieces of mine in the early stages and I basically email him saying, I don't know what to do with this. I've hit a wall. I've got no confidence. Maybe I should just stop, blah, 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 blah. He was very good with me. He said, you know, no, there's interesting things here. Just keep going, keep writing. And and uh, and he taught me how to lay out scores as well, how to typeset essential, time-saving, money-saving information. In fact, that alone has saved me more time and money than, than I can count that typesetting advice. Mm. Every composer must learn how to typeset properly. Mm. Um. But he he wrote something about the fact that it's as though I were painting in music um, and also vice versa. So when when I'm making music, it's as though I'm painting. And when I'm painting, it's as though the paintings have a sort of musical quality to them. So so the whole thing is sort of a a unity, actually. It links together. And they feed each other as well. They do. Absolutely. Yeah. I've heard many misconceptions from musicians and non-musicians about conductors yeah and what conductors do <laughs> um i'm sure people who are listening to this and watching this would have probably come across some um of these comments on orchestral youtube videos mm. for example um oh the orchestra plays so well they don't need a conductor mm. like what's the conductor doing there is there a need for a conductor what did they do and uh i thought it's probably a good idea to try and talk about this with you and explore this these conceptions that people have or misconceptions how um, long have you got <laughs> <laughs> well this can probably take up a whole episode um just i just want to get your thoughts on what these people are, are saying before i answer that excellent question uh what you were just saying about do we even need a conductor mm. it's funny i was actually conducting a piece of the late great harrison burt whistle a few years ago um <laughs> and it was with the London Sinfonietta, and one of the players came up to me in the break and said, no, 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 this piece, it does need a conductor, but it doesn't need an interpreter. <laughs> 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 and because of his, you know, his sound world, very archaic and ritualistic, and, you know, they were absolutely right about that. But but there is this question, I, I know plenty of people now who are doing a hip, cool, trendy thing of running conductorless ensembles. I think that it's a really interesting movement. I think it can garner some fantastic results. Uh, because you maintain the sense of chamber music. However, I think a good conductor should be able to do that as well, particularly a conductor with a background in chamber music. Um, I'm always looking at what is it a conductor can add by being put in a certain situation. Mm. So what will you get if the conductor's there that you simply wouldn't get if they're not there? So that's what I think particularly young conductors need to really think about Mm. is... What am I adding to this scenario? And so to come on to your question about the misconceptions, I always try and discourage my students and people I go to concerts with from judging conductors on their performances because you only see such a tiny sliver of what's actually going on. A conductor spends very little time on the concert podium in comparison to how long they spend in rehearsal. I mean... In this country, the comparison is not so much because you might do an hour and a half of concert and on three hours rehearsal, which is just stupid, but that's often the way they operate. But even so, you spend the majority of your time, if not the vast majority, in rehearsal situations with musicians. So much more than about, you know, showboating for the audience and striking a good posture, which I know a lot of young conductors are very keen to do for the, for the cameras, etc. I certainly used to do it. Uh, I, I became quite disillusioned with all of that. And, and I really try hard not to now. And as a result, the music making's got better. Mm. So that's interesting. Um, but I would say that a greater focus on how you run a rehearsal, how you delineate, well, you know, we're going to go from this point to this point in this much time, how you create a through line through the rehearsal, how you're going to structure it, uh, when the right time is to talk and intervene, and when the right time is to move on. Um, about 
talking actually it's interesting because some people say you must not talk at all uh, if you walk in and say good morning we're going from here please that's already too much um, <laughs> and some people love to talk and love to share their expertise um, Mark Elder is a great one you know he has so such a depth of knowledge um, you know having sat in on a lot of his rehearsals he can speak quite a lot but he's incredibly engaging so there's obviously no rule something that uh, a mentor of mine who's become a friend a real opera expert called An uh, Andrew Charity I actually had a drink with him just last night we were talking about this exact thing he said to me was um you're allowed to talk so long as you have something to say <laughs> it sounds obvious but you know it, it having something to say with, with the music is, is really really crucial and then deciding you know how you're gonna structure your time uh, over over the course of a rehearsal period how you're going to build relationships with the players inside the rehearsal and outside if you're a kind of jet setting international conductor and you're going and standing in front of 80 people you've never met before who speak a different first language to you mm. um, and then you give a concert and then you're off again it's like well that's not going to be special unless you really invest the effort to connect with these people as as people um, yeah so I, I think that's absolutely crucial that's one of the big misconceptions is mm -hmm. that kind of the podium and the performance is, is what it's all about actually it's, it's that building of relationships mm -hmm. is really crucial watch out because it's not taught nobody teaches it i've had one teacher who's taught it uh, who's a danish conductor uh, mostly choral conductor called peter hunker uh, who is the most again a, a really wonderful man i've been very fortunate uh, to, to work with him on, on the Oxford Musical Leadership Programme. I don't know if that's still going, actually, but I did a year's worth of conducting choirs in Oxford with him as my, my guide. Uh, and he actually taught, you know, the stuff like, you know, you're going along, you're going along, uh, and how to stop and write immediately. We're going to start talking, engage them, and we're going to go from here, and let's get right back into it. And, for instance, how you conduct at the beginning of a rehearsal when you're reading a piece nobody knows, particularly a new piece, if I've written it, mm -hmm. you know, give very broad, clear gestures, not particularly expressive. And then how that changes as you go on, as people know the piece, you become more nuanced, you let them get on with more of it themselves. I mean, that stuff is just, that's priceless. And most teaching of conducting focuses almost purely on the physical gesture. Mm, yeah. And I find that more and more confusing and and. I mean, this is not a dig at anyone in particular because I've been fortunate to meet and, and work with a number of wonderful conductors and teachers who I really admire. But I find it a little bit sickening now, this focus on the physical gesture. Mm -hmm. So many of the great conductors who are revered in the past managed to get these astonishing, very fine results. And if you watch videos, like, it's a, you know, look at Furtwängler conducting. I mean, what the hell is going on? Like, nobody could understand what on earth he was doing. But there was something about it you know and that i think that's that's the case with many of them mm. and but as you said most of that work is done before even going to to concert it's done in the rehearsal would you say yeah all that preparation and and, and before of course i mean in terms of learning the scores and preparing them mm. and all, all, all that stuff um yeah, you don't see even a, a, a sliver of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, a slightly different misconception, I suppose, is that the conductor is in control. I mean, the conductor is certainly a leadership figure, but you don't control the intonation. You don't control the ensemble. You mm. don't control the volume. You don't control the speed. You interact with all these things. You can have an effect on some of them some of the time. Mm -hmm. But to think that you're in control, I think, is a huge fallacy. Who is in control? Or is there anyone? Uh, no one's in control. Well, that's the question. I mean, it's sort of an ephemeral thing. It, it's a kind of extrasensory thing. Because as much as you're the driving force behind the music, you're also listening. You've got to be listening to, to what it is you're being given and, and to treat that with respect and reverence. And, you know, sometimes you don't want to say anything at all. You just you actually want to listen. It's, it's like a gift that you're receiving. And in the rehearsal, I think rehearsals are so special. They're, they're like science labs where you can experiment and do things. And some of the things you get in rehearsal are so joyous, so far beyond anything you could get in a concert. A concert is a different job. You have to try and kind of transcend all the work that you've done. Mm -hmm. but, but, oh man, rehearsals are special. But I mean, the thing which I think you can control in a sort of ephemeral way is phrasing. Mm -hmm. Um... One goes to so many concerts which are totally unphrased. You don't hear a single phrase. You don't hear the shape. Um, and in order to understand that, you've got to understand harmony. Mm -hmm. I assisted Jonathan Cohen 
and his group Arcangelo when they did Theodora at the BBC Proms in 2018. Um, and he was directing from the keyboard. And I was asking him about a particular movement. I was saying, you know, this typical conductor question, oh, are you going to do this in two or in four? And I was thinking, well, he's going to answer something very academic, like, well, you know, they need a lead here, so we better be in four. We can give a subdivision there so they can. And he just said, well, what's the harmony doing? How often does the harmony change? And I looked at it, it's like, well, every bar. It's like, well, if you conduct it in four, it's going to be kind of really boring. <laughs> so you've got it at least in two, actually with a feeling of one, a big round cyclical thing, because the harmonic rhythm is what drives the phrasing, and the phrasing is what drives the arc structure of the music, which takes you right from the beginning, right to the very end. Like when the other day at the proms, Andrew Manza did the most wonderful sea symphony, you know, 70 minute piece. You need to be able to see the end of the piece on the horizon mm -hmm. when you start at the beginning. Um, so in a sense, in order to phrase, you you know, there, there's this sense of breathing life into the ensemble. And I think that that is, going back to what a conductor can contribute, that's something that you can contribute. Mm -hmm. So why not focus on that? Yeah, that's a brilliant segue to my next um, point of discussion. Well, there's a there's a quote from Esther Pekka Salonen mm. that I'll read right now for the, for the listeners. So yeah. here he goes. So quote, my music wouldn't sound the way it does if I hadn't had the experience of conducting. Now, this goes back to the point of you made where seeing, you can see the end of the piece and this overarching structure. Um, do you think conducting has had any influence on the way you compose music? Because when you're at the podium, you have this opportunity to see, not just physically be up high and see everything, but you also have the privilege of seeing the piece in all its detail and how it develops throughout. Mm. I mean, other instruments can, but they their main priority is on their part and maybe seeing how their part fits in with the other instruments. But you, as a conductor, you, you have the responsibility of overseeing everything. Mm. Any thoughts on this? Have you had, um, I guess, any thoughts of how conducting has influenced your composing. So there's two interesting things in there. One is the Salonen quote and the other is responsibility. So mm -hmm. let's come back to responsibility. Sure. The Salonen quote, I would actually give that a strong disagree. Mm. Interestingly. Good. Okay. Well, why? But, well but before I explain why, let me try and understand what it is he's getting at. Because sure. it's possible that, you know, you and I and, and he and I are coming at it from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I say this with immense respect for Ezepeka Salonen as a conductor and as a composer. Um his cello concerto, which premiered a few years ago, uh, with some live electronics in the orchestra, it was I was it Trulls Merck who played it? It was fantastic, really stupendous piece, uh, very very special indeed. I mean, Stravinsky's music, for instance, becomes more conductible as he learnt to conduct. Any conductor who has <laughs> looked at the Firebird, for instance, which is every conductor because every conductor wants to do the Firebird. Uh, knows that some of the metric modulations are completely impractical and stupid, actually. Poorly written, poorly conceived, which from a composer uh, as fastidious as Stravinsky is kind of unexpected. Mm. Um, so I, I, I think it's, you know, it can in some cases lend a sort of a practical element. I, I mean, other composers, maybe like Mahler, who in his day was not really seen as a composer, uh, he was seen as a virtuoso conductor, whatever the hell that means. Uh, and it's interesting that his legacy has not been as a conductor, but as a composer. And I think composers would do well to to remember that. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the contribution you actually want to make? Why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll come on to that later because I think it's, you know, I'm interested to know why a young conductor would want to take on the burden of, of what conducting is. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, but, you know, Mahler's music is perfumed in some places by music that he'd been conducting naturally. I, I think that's a natural process. Uh, and I think that it's certainly helpful as a composer. We talked about this last time we ch chatted on the podcast to maintain empathy with the players mm -hmm. and what it is they need to do. I was telling you in the car on the way over here, I've recently completed this piano concerto. Um, we <laughs> Certainly there are... Uh, some moments in it which are 
virtuosic for the orchestra to the point of brutality so actually i would do well to go back and, and think about some of that and actually get back to some conducting and have a think about those demands um however as i said before my primary inspirations for music come from outside music mm -hmm. often from painting sometimes from poetry this concerto actually in many ways is like an epic poem uh, that's how i sort of envisaged it uh, theater sometimes but certainly you know the performing aspect of theater um, I would say that composing is a purely creative pursuit until at the end it becomes practical I think we also talked about the fact you you go from being a creator to being like a technician and an engineer mechanic whereas conducting right from the start you have all these kind of practical um, obstacles in your way whether it's personal and interpersonal elements how you're engaging with people or you know in terms of running echo it's a huge amount of logistics and it's a completely different part of the brain which one has to access in order to do that and this process of running a rehearsal it's like well i, I want to put my my mark on this piece it's like well yes in time but actually do you really you know is it is it fair to put one's mark on a on a great piece. I think in, in defense of, uh, you know, being a young conductor, I, I've mused on this stuff a lot. And, you know, I, I sort of had a bit of an identity crisis. Where I, I'm not sure that young people should be conducting. You know, it, it's... Uh, so I can be pretty hard on, on young conductors, my, myself very much included. Uh, it's quite a new phenomenon that young people should take to the podium. It used to be that you spent a lifetime in the orchestra developing knowledge and experience before you stepped out onto the podium and offered that wisdom to others, which is why I'm constantly going, oh, my students are so bored of hearing this. What is it that it, it, you want to offer? And, you know, I'm only just starting to kind of work out now that th those kinds of very deep questions. In fact, I'm sure I'm looking in the wrong places and in five years it'll, you know, swing off somewhere else completely because I, you know, I know nothing. We're both young. You know, I I'm perfectly happy to admit that I know nothing. Um, but if I were to say one thing in defense of young conductors, I think the get up and go is really important. The feeling that you, you, there comes a point in your life when you're pretty young and naive, suddenly you get a feeling that I want to do this music and I know just how it should go. And if that's the case, go and see if you're right. Um, uh, you know, it's the opportunities aren't just going to come. You've got to make them. You've got to sculpt them and craft them. Um but I, I would say that composing is a much more creative activity and, and conducting is kind of beset by all these um, different elements. You know, if, if I try to mix them too much, also if you're writing a piece and you're thinking already about how the performance is going to be received, it just stimmies the, the creativity. Mm -hmm. So I would respectfully uh, push back against Salonen on that particular point. Um, the point about responsibility, just quickly, it's very interesting because... I think this is true in leadership positions in business and in the military uh, and pretty much anywhere, actually. If things are going right, then it's always because somebody else is doing something great and you mm. always want to give away that ownership. Mm. And if something goes wrong, it is always your fault <laughs> as the leader. It's, it doesn't matter who played the out of tune note. It's, you know, I'm running the ship. It's my responsibility. Um, and it's not, uh, you know, I'm not just saying that because, like, you know, oh, it gets them off my back. It's like, it's actually true. It's true that it's my fault if the playing isn't up to scratch for whatever reason. And so you go back and go, well, how could, you know, what, what could I have done that didn't, that I didn't do? H how have I somehow been less than I could be in putting this whole thing together? And often you'll end up with fairly uncomfortable um and interesting answers uh, but, but because of that dynamic the life of a, a conductor particularly you know conductors who come to study in Britain or go to America to study for instance they want to be jet setting international stars going, <laughs> you know going around guest conducting all these different orchestras and you know with kind of principal conductorships in different countries for 16 weeks a year or whatever um, whereas if you go to Germany, say, then you want to go up through the, the Kapellmeister system and you're maybe one of the opera houses and you stay in a particular place and you really work your gold watch career. You, <laughs> you nurture the artistic integrity of a, of a, of a particular place. But, but you know, if, if you're coming here to study, for instance, in the UK uh, and you want that career, then, it, you know, the kinds of sacrifices involved are, dare I say this, 
not the sorts of sacrifices any reasonable person would make. Because if you want to have a life, you know, have weekends with your family, with your significant other, with your children, if you have them. Um, if you want to maintain good relationships with your partner, with your friends, it, you know, you sacrifice all of that, basically. And I think most conductors would agree with that. Um and, and, you know, some people just love that lifestyle and they manage to, to to weather it really well. And I know that it takes an incredible personal toll on some people, which is one of many reasons why I recently decided, recently, a few years ago, I'm a composer first. Because if you don't spend the time composing, it doesn't get done. Conducting can hoover up as many hours as you're willing to, to feed it. Um, and composing has been good for my character as a person it, it's helped me settle down it's helped me be more focused more disciplined uh it's helped me be a better friend to my friends and a better partner uh to my wonderful partner sarah who's also a composer so we you know very much have a mutual understanding on this point uh and you know makes me easier to live with for my for my family uh, and, and the conducting commitments while very important to me have to be mitigated and controlled um i think this is a really important thing for people to realize because so many people who kind of go into it thinking it's going to be this great extravagant mm. sort of big leadership career i i think are sort of slightly missing the fact that those sacrifices are not the kind of sacrifice that any reasonable person would make and i said this to myself when i was just conducting 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 without stopping um and, and you know going on courses here and lessons there and putting on gazillions of concerts and it's like you know what what are you what are you trying to get out of this? You know, what, what, what's what's the end game here? It, you know, you know how to conduct now, fine. <laughs> like, you know, it, it, it's not like you need to keep creating opportunities to conduct so that you can learn how to conduct. Uh, up to a certain point, that's true. But, but then it's like, you know, what kind of life do you want to have? Why do you want to do it? What kind of commitment do you want to make? Um, and, you know, I feel that the primary commitment I want to make to, to music and to the world during my life is through my composing so that's that's where the focus is but um i think when conductors can you know if they decide that's what they absolutely want to do and they can manage the responsibilities and the sacrifices in a way which is appropriate uh it can be a magnificent thing to behold mm. sadly you know the best conductor of all time carlos kleiber uh undoubtedly if anyone ever says anything different the next line is always, well, what about Carlos Kleiber? <laughs> you know, he's, you, there are lots of wonderful conductors, but obviously he, he was the greatest. And um, he's not exactly a great role model where family life <laughs> and kind of normal day-to-day -day living was, was concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the end, he felt so creatively blocked and pressured by the whole thing that he stopped conducting almost. He just didn't do it anymore. My theory about Carlos Kleiber is that he was actually a blocked composer, creatively blocked composer. He composed in his youth. And again, his his father, Eric Kleiber, who was also a great conductor, sort of managed to basically stop him having any confidence with anything. Somehow, you know, we're fortunate he managed to continue conducting. Mm -hmm. Although I think he was actually a composer. Mm. That's my secret. Yeah. That's now out on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. I think that's yeah. pretty insightful. Um, so let's, let's move on to your opera. Mm. Tell us about your new opera. Well, the opera is called The Child and Striped Pajamas. Mm -hmm. yep. It's based on the the iconic best-selling Holocaust fable for children and families by John Boyne, a wonderful Irish author who's written, I think, 14 or 15 novels now, and, and he has a long list of awards, and he, he's a lovely, lovely man. Um, it's been a, a story that was very special to me since I was very young. And I'm really pleased that we've had the opportunity to, to, to do this. It's been five years in the making and we're finally giving the premiere production with Echo Ensemble in London in January. Mm -hmm. And what, Was this um, composition process different from your previous experiences with composing? or um, Because it's been a big, this story has been a big, big part of your life. Mm. Did you find it easier than expected or maybe more difficult in the sense that it hit home? There were lots and lots of challenges involved in this. Um, I would separate them into personal, practical and musical challenges. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, 
so I mean the obvious ones are the practical ones so I have never composed an opera before um, and I was doing it all for the first time I was learning a lot uh, like how to you know include support for the singers in the texture when you've got very few instruments um, how to create a piece of that scale it's a 75 minute piece in two acts the first act is 40 minutes in just two scenes there it's almost split directly in half they're 20 minutes each um, and carrying the tension of, of the story that that through line through all that music and you know being constantly inventive but also um, repetitive enough uh, and derivative enough that you can keep the audience with you on the journey particularly mm. as it's going to be you know it's a new piece you want it to really uh, communicate um, it was all consuming so from a practical perspective managing energy uh, learning how to be disciplined have a schedule which is not something I'd really seriously done before um, all that was incredibly important there were musical challenges obviously some of which I've touched on um, and, and you know dramatic challenges like you know creating this wealth of different characters in the music the innocence of the children versus the kind of the darkness of the situation and the slightly dark worldliness of the father who is in a sense the adult villain of the piece and yet he's also sickeningly the character to whom the audience ends up relating the most because he is the one who is committing evil atrocities in the belief that he's doing good so there's this kind of artistic challenge of living up to the deep profound symbolic narrative which is why this book has had such a resonance and by the way um the book has sold over 11 million copies uh, it's uh, you know it's still topping bestseller lists and it was written a long time ago now 15 years ago uh, it's phenomenally successful and kid most kids don't like to read and this is a book about the holocaust it, it's an unbelievable achievement that john's made i think it's partially resentment of the level of that achievement uh, and also a misunderstanding of this symbolic nature of the story mm -hmm. which is why there have been these kind of odious hit pieces written in various newspapers and by various people over the over the last few years i have no doubt this is a book that will be talked about in 100 years possibly 500 possibly more than that uh, and like the kind of contempt and sadness with which we hold people who kind of stormed out of premieres of the right of spring because they found it all too dis distressing and you know i think that historical critics are going to hold the critics of this book mm. in contempt because mm. interestingly children get the depth of the symbolism and, and the fact that symbolically it's a deep truth about the extinguishing of innocence that's what the holocaust did it's the same thing that primo levy an actual holocaust survivor writes about in if this is a man mm. um so the kids get it and the adults don't. Mm -hmm. And that sort of leads me on to the third kind of challenge, which was a personal challenge. Obviously, the darkness of the topic matter, the fact it's very close to home. Um, I have relatives who were killed in the Holocaust. The only reason I'm here is because there were several who very narrowly escaped. Um, you know, and all Jews have that story. It's always the narrow escape because the ones who didn't narrowly escape are the ones who died. And that was the the vast majority. Um so you know both in terms of digging deep into myself uh in order to kind of meet that responsibility to get it right and and, and um and and battling the feeling that somehow this wasn't within my capability so i actually came out of the process of writing the piece with an expanded sense of what i was capable of which was a, a, a great exciting journey uh, but but also the personal thing of you know writing something that cuts so close to the bone and we're knowing that it's going to upset some people uh because the topic matter is is of that nature mm -hmm. uh the whole thing was by far the most difficult thing i've done but also by virtue of that the most rewarding mm -hmm. i would i would say mm -hmm. and why the medium of opera why not a orchestral suite for example so good question an orchestral suite would have uh, avoided the copyright battle i had with with miramax where they asked me for one million dollars for the rights to the story really yes one million dollars <laughs> one million yeah they waived that um because i i convinced them that was the right thing to do i'm very grateful they did it was an absolute pain dealing with that uh but now there are collaborators and i'm very very pleased that they've given us the permission to do this um uh, but Opera deals in these grand narratives, the, these symbolic narratives. And you don't come out of an opera thinking this is a true story. 
which is part of the problem people seem to... I mean, I, I can't imagine reading Boy in the Striped Pajamas and thinking that it was a true story. Mm-hmm. It, it's a work of fiction, and a work of fiction can't be historically inaccurate. It's fiction. Um, and actually, it is a well-researched piece of fiction, which you know pe- pe- people don't necessarily give it credit for. Um, but, you know, I, I can't understand why, pe- why people come away from it saying that. I've never met anyone who says that. Apparently, some people do, and that's probably more to do with the way that it's taught. Uh, but certainly for an opera, you never come away from it saying, oh, well, that really happened. Uh, and it kind of feeds into this identity crisis that opera is having at the moment, I would say. Um, new opera doesn't quite seem to know what to do with itself at the moment. It's not clear on what it wants to be. And, and there have been some attempts to kind of turn real life events into opera, which to my mind, not many of those have come off very well. So now we have all these other mediums like film and Netflix and podcasts and, uh, you know, theatre and television and all, all these different things. What role does opera play? And I think that opera is capable of dealing with these deep, profound, dark, symbolic stories like nothing else can. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's the feeling shared by our director, Guido Martin Brandis, with whom I'm really looking forward to working on this because he absolutely gets that side of it. Mm-hmm. And what effect did writing this piece have on you as an artist? Oh, uh, well, I mean, the stuff already mentioned, yeah. it, 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 I, I would say it really helped me become much more robust and, and together as a person uh, and as an artist. But, but particularly, I mean, the personal effect was huge. So in order to write it, um, I had to expand my sense of my own capability. Mm. Uh, I had to do a lot of reading uh, and watching of dark stuff that people would frankly rather avoid uh, and one can see why even though one has to confront it that's part of what the opera is trying to do is help people confront it but in order to do that you know I had to also confront it in a way that maybe I, I hadn't before and, and that kind of brought me closer to my my biblical heritage as well going back to what we were saying about about Babel um, so there's a lot of stuff washing around in there you know faith and family history world history the core texts at the core of our culture the bible the psychoanalytic literature we're actually related to the freud family uh, my family who escaped vienna were were related um so that's that's kind of unusual and interesting i'd say the big one w- was deleting social media as well mm-hmm. i just showed you I, i've also just recently got rid of my smartphone i haven't got my phone on me now but i've got a nokia brick <laughs> uh, which i would highly recommend i mean my screen time is way down there now and it's but it's incredible when you get rid of this stuff several things happen first of all you have three more hours every day that's 21 hours a week by the way even people who say that they limit their time on social media we know they don't they know they don't <laughs> And they know they should get rid of it, but they have an excuse like, I need it for work. Mm-hmm. That's another element of it is, is the kind of ones always posting about oneself. Even people who aren't particularly narcissistic, which is, you know, m- most people aren't. But this thing can really turn on a part of you which is very self-serving. And, you know, I try sharing things other people were doing. And, you know, for some reason, people weren't interested in that. Uh, so, you know, I, I, life doesn't work like that, basically. But, but imagine if you had, you know, 21 hours is nearly a whole day. You have a whole day every week that you're getting back. You know, you can spend that working, which is what I did. I spent it working on the opera. You can spend it with your significant others. I mean, even just three hours more a week. Isn't that a worthwhile trade-off for this thing that you don't even enjoy scrolling through, which makes you feel terrible first thing in the morning and last thing at night and every single moment in between? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like we're sleepwalking. And that's the the other thing, I guess, is that it's it helps you think in high resolution so much of what's going on on social media is this very low resolution thinking. People think that they can show support for a cause they care about by posting about it on social media. Sorry, I took a cause I cared about and I turned it into an opera. I, you know, I consider that caring about a cause. If you care about something deeply enough, I expect you to actually go and do something about it mm-hmm. and maybe learn about yourself and the cause itself along the way rather than just posting something on social media. That's pathetic. Mm-hmm. Um, Sorry, I don't pull my punches with this stuff because I, I think it's so, so ridiculous. Uh, but also people think they can learn a history lesson on Instagram. You know, you have an infograph, which, you know, puts the bullet points of, or, you know, how to take a medical science exam in mental health awareness um, or, you know, anything else you care to mention. Uh, it, it just, you know, 
it, it creates a very low resolution way of thinking, which is why I think things have become so reactionary with mm. different um, kind of forces against one another and, you know, at each other's throats, arguing about stuff that they don't even really deeply understand. Mm-hmm. Right when I quit, um, it was when I sort of put my foot on the gas with the opera and decided I was going to finish it. I cleared the decks from May 2021 through September and I decided I was just going to finish it. Um, got rid of everything and it's you know part of the reason i got rid of the social media was because there was a particular thing going on at the time which i knew quite a lot about but i didn't feel informed enough to start posting about it and a bunch of people who had never heard a single thing about it until that day and knew next to nothing were getting all shirty and angry and posting about it i thought this is absolutely unbearable who do you think you are to be doing this Uh, and i don't believe that's really those people either it, it's something like comes out and possesses you. And we'd just be better off as a species without that, mm. I think. Well, just a final question. I wish I could talk to you for much longer. But in terms of promotion, mm. tell us about the opera. When is it going to happen? And where? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so it's going out late August. Yeah. Yes. Great. So tickets are opening up. Box office is opening on the 1st of September. Uh, so you can book your tickets. Highly recommend getting in there because it's, you know, Boy in the Striped Pajamas is a very popular property. Uh, it's in central London. We're expecting it to sell out. And early bird tickets are available until the 16th of October. So they're available for six weeks. Uh, so you should get in on that lovely discount. If you're under 25, there's a discount as well. And Obviously, it's a book for children. So if you want to come as a school, we extend that discount to teachers as well. So you should uh, get in touch and we can hit you up and organize that for you. Uh, if you're in a slightly better position to help, you might also want to add a donation to your ticket. You can do that. Um, or you can actually get in touch directly and support the project. And for people who want to do that, there are some wonderful perks on offer. We've got signed copies of The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Uh, they are signed by the author, John Boyne, uh, and by me, the composer, and by Guido, our director. Uh, you can come to an open rehearsal with a drinks reception, so you can get a sneak peek of the piece and see what goes into bringing a project like that of that magnitude to life get a sense of what it's going to be like what it's going to be about um and man a whole host of other things we've actually got a live q a uh, online with john boyne where you can ask him your questions this is a paragon of wisdom and experience we're talking i mean he's he's a great guy and he really is an interesting man to talk to so that's you know these are exclusive opportunities not to be missed Mm -hmm. Uh, so if you're interested in all of that and you like to support this this very very special piece uh, then please hit me up you can do that through my website www.nomax.net and he's very kindly going to put a link there's mm-hmm. a contact page goes straight to my email and i will sort you out with that um the performances are going to be on the 11th and 12th of january at the cockpit which is in marlebone just off listen grove uh near the wonderful fish and chip shop so you could have a wonderful fish and chips and then come to hear a depressing opera <laughs> <laughs> or you could come here at depressing opera and then go recover with a lovely fish and chips. <laughs> or you could have fish and chips, come to the opera, and then be so depressed that you want to go have another fish and chips. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it's going to be incredibly special. I, I can already feel with the planning that we're doing, the, the, the buzz uh, that's in the room. And it's, you know, we, we've got some wonderful singers. We've got Ashley Rishes as the father, terrifying force of nature. Uh, we've got Lieutenant Kotler, uh, Xavier Hetherington, the fantastic Susanna McRae and Rachel Roper as our children, um, and the wonderful Echo Ensemble, who I'm always pleased to promote their work. They're such wonderful people. Mm. And, you know, I hope there's going to be many more performances of this piece, but there's something special about being there at the beginning, particularly for something like this, where there's been a buzz around it for a while and it's, it's gradually growing. And if you're listening to this, I would just love for you to be there. I'd love for you to experience it. So please come along, choose your method of getting involved, share it with your friends, your loved ones, and uh, yeah, get some. We'll see you there. Yeah, five years in the making. So five years in the making. Finally happening. Well, Noah, Max, thank you very much for coming on to the podcast. Pleasure. Thanks for having me back, Anthony. Anthony.